Welcome to part six. If you'll allow me a construction metaphor, I want to make sure we're building on a solid foundation. In Climate Basics 1.0, I talked about our difficulty in understanding exponential growth. We routinely talk of things snowballing and things spiraling out of control. We talk about vicious cycles and runaway inflation. But even with all these phrases in our vocabulary, we tend to project future trends linearly, in a straight line, not exponentially. Tragically, the coronavirus is providing daily lessons in exponential behavior. Let me point out another important concept that contributes to misunderstanding the climate crisis. It is the concept of delays. You want to cook some spaghetti for dinner. You put a pot of water on the stovetop, turn on the heat, and go away for five or 10 minutes until the water reaches a boil. You expect a time lag, a delay. The analogy isn't perfect, but the flame under the pot is analogous to the heating that results from our emissions of greenhouse gases and other climate pollutants. The pot of water is the world's climate system. We routinely talk about the pollutants that we're dumping into the atmosphere, but let's remember that the atmosphere is but one component of an infinitely complex climate system. Earth's climate system is thought of as five parts or spheres. There's the atmosphere, the air we breathe, the most obvious part of the climate system. And of course, there's the hydrosphere, the 71% of the Earth's surface covered by the oceans and all the waters of the world. And there's the cryosphere, the roughly 10% of the Earth's surface that's permanently frozen, the glaciers, the ice caps, and the great ice sheets. And there's the lithosphere, the soil and rocks. And finally, the biosphere, all the living things, both flora and fauna, including us. These five spheres all interact. The oceans, the hydrosphere, for instance, has absorbed over 90% of the excess heat caused by climate pollutants in the atmosphere, masking and delaying by decades the full climate effect of those pollutants. To say that the Earth's climate system is complex is a monumental understatement. The deforestation and tilling of soil that began during the Holocene first lit the flame under the pot but it was our rampant use of fossil fuels that made possible the Industrial Revolution that really got the flame burning hot. And we've been steadily turning up the flame year after year after year. The climate crisis results from a change in the Earth's energy balance, an imbalance between incoming energy from the sun and outgoing energy from the Earth. Here's how it works. Energy from the sun drives the Earth's climate system. Some of the incoming solar energy is absorbed by the atmosphere and some is bounced back into space by clouds or by light surfaces like snow and ice. The rest is absorbed by the Earth, which then emits heat in the form of terrestrial radiation, some of which is trapped in the atmosphere by greenhouse gases or is bounced back by clouds and the rest of which escapes into space. Prior to human intervention in the climate system, and despite the volcanoes, wildfires, asteroids, and the tilt and wobble in the Earth's orbit, incoming and outgoing radiation were in dynamic balance. The Earth was said to be in energy balance. The difference between incoming solar radiation and outgoing terrestrial radiation is called radiative forcing. Positive radiative forcing increases the heat, while negative radiative forcing decreases the heat. Note that the words positive and negative here are not value judgments, they just mean up and down. Positive does not mean it's a good thing. The problem now is that the Earth's energy balance has been thrown out of whack by human-caused climate pollutants that have trapped some of the outgoing radiation, resulting in a net increase in radiative forcing. 
In response, the whole climate system is forced to adjust, seeking a new equilibrium level with increased heating, which results in the devastating climate impacts that we are now witnessing. Radiative forcing is measured in watts per square meter, like the energy of little light bulbs over every square meter of the Earth's surface. We're used to talking about the quantity of greenhouse gases in the Earth's atmosphere in units of parts per million of atmospheric CO2. Radiative forcing is the heating effect of those greenhouse gases. You might think of it this way. A given quantity of firewood stacked in the woodshed results in a known heating effect when that firewood is burned. Let's dig a little deeper into climate pollutants. They are more precisely called climate forcers. The gases, particulate matter, and aerosols that cause radiative forcing are climate forcers. There are both positive and negative climate forcers. Most of our climate pollutants are positive climate forcers that heat the planet. They include long-lived greenhouse gases like carbon dioxide, which can remain in the atmosphere up to a thousand years, and so-called short-lived climate forcers, which typically last for days to decades. They include methane, black carbon, tropospheric ozone, and fluorinated gases, or F gases, most of which are far more effective at trapping heat than CO2 on a ton for ton basis. But some of our pollutants are actually negative climate forcers that tend to cool the planet. At the top of the list are the so-called bright sulfate aerosols that don't get much attention. Like CO2, they are a byproduct of burning fossil fuels, but unlike CO2, they are negative climate forcers that tend to cool the planet. As we decrease emissions from combustion of fossil fuels, we lose the short-lived negative forcing that these aerosols provide, resulting in a net increase in radiative forcing and an increase in heating of the planet. Here are the main climate forcers, both positive forcers and negative forcers. First we'll list them, and then we'll talk about some of them in more detail. The list of greenhouse gases includes carbon dioxide, methane, nitrous oxide, and the fluorinated gases, or so-called F gases. The other major forcers include black carbon, tropospheric ozone, and aerosols. Let's first acknowledge that CO2 is the main villain heating our planet. Each of us living in the United States causes the release of over 16 tons of CO2 emissions every year. Globally, CO2 emissions were over 40 billion tons or gigatons in 2018. That's more than a billion tons every 10 days. But how do we even think about a ton of atmospheric CO2? A ton of CO2 occupies a sphere 33 feet in diameter. But while CO2 is the dominant human-caused climate forcer, it's not the only one. To compare the warming impact of the other climate forcers in the atmosphere to that of carbon dioxide, we use a metric called global warming potential, or GWP. GWP is simply a ratio of the number of tons of atmospheric carbon dioxide that would result in radiative forcing equal to that of one ton of another greenhouse gas over a specified time frame, usually 100 years. Once we know the GWP of different climate forcers, the overall climate impact of all the pollutants can be calculated in tons of carbon dioxide equivalent written as CO2 little e. So globally, each year, humans add about 40 gigatons of CO2 
plus an additional 10 gigatons of CO2 equivalent from other climate sources for a total of about 50 billion of those CO2 spheres. But it gets really challenging when talking about the global warming potential of short-lived climate forcers. Methane is a prime example. As you probably know, methane is the main component of natural gas. Fugitive emissions of methane from the production, distribution, and storage of natural gas are a major climate pollutant. Methane emissions also result from enteric fermentation in livestock, from landfills, and from coal mining. Compared to CO2, which persists in the climate system for anywhere from a few hundred to a thousand years, methane persists in the atmosphere for around 10 to 12 years. So comparisons over a 100-year time frame end up vastly understating the damaging effects of methane. When compared over a 100-year period, a ton of methane has a global warming potential of 34. That is, one ton of methane is 34 times more potent than one ton of CO2. This is written as GWP 100. But when compared over a 20-year time frame, methane's global warming potential jumps to 86. And when compared over a period of one year, methane has a global warming potential of over 150. Let me repeat that. Over the course of the year that it's emitted, one ton of methane, CH4, is over 150 times more damaging to the Earth's climate than a ton of CO2. Black carbon is another short-lived climate forcer. Black carbon results from the burning of coal, diesel, wood, and other carbon-based fuels. It is a particulate that remains suspended in the atmosphere for only days or weeks, not years, making comparisons with CO2 over long time frames essentially meaningless. Though very short-lived, black carbon is one of the top three contributors to global warming alongside CO2 and methane. A secondary characteristic of black carbon is that it settles out of the atmosphere onto glaciers, ice sheets, and snow fields as dark particles, which reduce albedo or reflectivity, causing more heat to be absorbed, leading to even more melting. This image, taken in Greenland, shows the impact of black carbon and other dark particulates that have settled on the ice. Another class of short-lived climate forcers is the large family of chemical compounds known as fluorinated gases, or F gases, that are widely used as refrigerants, solvents, pesticides, as electrical insulators, as blowing agents in the production of rigid insulation, and in a wide range of industrial processes. Some of these short-lived climate forcers are thousands of times more potent than CO2 on a ton-for-ton -ton basis. The five main types of F gases will not be on the test. The upshot is this. While we reduce emissions of CO2 and other long-lived climate forcers, we also need to immediately start reducing emissions of these short-lived, high-potency climate forcers that have an outsized heat-trapping effect. Doing so represents one of our best ways of reducing total human-caused radiative forcing in this decade. As an example, eliminating a ton of methane emissions each year for the next 10 years would be 1,500 times more effective at reducing radiative forcing than eliminating a ton of CO2 each year over the same period. Here's a look at the radiative forcing effect of all the accumulated greenhouse gases that we've dumped since the dawn of the Industrial Revolution up until 2011. Note the vertical zero line in red. Positive forcers are on the right side of the red line, 
negative forcers are on the left side. Note that the total radiative forcing effect due to methane is huge, 0.97 watts per square meter, compared to that of CO2, 1.68. Note also the largest negative radiative forcing is due to aerosols. Let's take a break from this technical talk and switch gears a bit. Let's take a look at which countries have been most responsible for adding climate forcers to the Earth's climate system. We can look at current emissions on the left. In recent years, China, in red, has overtaken the US, in blue, in annual emissions of greenhouse gases, due in part to accounting methods. Emissions are allocated to the country from which the emissions are released. Since the emissions associated with all the stuff that we import from China show up as China's emissions, as we offshore manufacturing to China and other countries, our US emissions are less than they otherwise would be. And we can look on the right at accumulated greenhouse gas emissions by country. That is, past emissions that are still in the atmosphere causing radiative forcing today. They are the unfortunate legacy of past pollution, which is why these are sometimes referred to as legacy emissions. This is what the Earth's climate system feels. The Earth responds to the radiative forcing effect of all the accumulated greenhouse gases. We will note that the United States and Europe, the leaders among the affluent industrialized global north, are the big winners in this category. Radiative forcing is the leading indicator of climate change. Global average temperature is the lagging indicator, changing in response to increasing or decreasing radiative forcing. At the COP15 climate talks in Copenhagen in 2009, the parties reached a hard-won agreement to set a climate target based on two degrees centigrade of warming the lagging indicator. At COP21 in Paris in 2015, the parties reaffirmed their ambition to keep the global average temperature below two degrees centigrade and to strive to limit the increase to 1.5 degrees centigrade. But setting a target based on a lagging indicator means that our response to climate instability will always be decades too late we need to also focus our goals and metrics on radiative forcing, the leading indicator. Think for just a moment of the delays involved in this whole system. There's a delay between increased radiative forcing and its effect on global temperatures, a delay between increase in global temperatures and public perceptions, a delay between public perceptions and meaningful actions, and a delay between implementation of actions and measurable effects of those actions. As of today, the total net radiative forcing due to human activities is around 2.7 watts per square meter, higher than at any time during human presence on Earth, and higher than the Earth has seen since the Pliocene epoch three million years ago. And total net radiative forcing has recently been increasing at a rate of 0.4 watts per square meter every 10 years. Let us remember that the natural swings between ice ages and interglacial periods were caused by fluctuations in radiative forcing that were much smaller than present human-caused radiative forcing and took place over a much longer time scale. And lastly, we're now talking about climate tipping points. What do we mean by tipping points? In systems jargon, most systems behave according to the interaction of one or more feedback loops. And feedback loops are of two kinds. First, there are balancing feedback loops that tend to maintain equilibrium or stability. Think of the mechanisms in our bodies that maintain our fluid levels, our fuel levels, 
our sleep levels. Or think of a thermostat controlling a furnace or a water heater at or around a selected set point. The other type of feedback loop tends to do the opposite. Amplifying feedback loops tend to lead systems away from equilibrium. Think of population growth or runaway inflation, the growth of money in an interest-bearing account, traffic, or cancer. Exp exponential growth results from amplifying feedback loops. These are the ones that are sometimes referred to as vicious cycles. In the Earth's climate system, we are seeing many worrisome amplifying feedback loops. Consider the ice albedo effect. Increased temperatures in the Arctic cause increased melting of sea ice, which exposes more dark water, which absorbs more heat, which causes temperatures to increase even further, which causes more ice melt, and on and on in a vicious cycle. Consider melting permafrost. As temperatures increase, permanently frozen tundra starts to melt, which causes the release of both CO2 and methane, which causes additional warming, which causes additional CO2 and methane release, etc. A tipping point refers to an amplifying feedback loop that passes the point of no return. According to a 2019 paper in the journal Nature, quote, the IPCC introduced the idea of climate tipping points two decades ago. At that time, these large-scale discontinuities in the climate system were considered likely only if global warming exceeded five degrees centigrade above pre-industrial levels. Information summarized in the two most recent IPCC special reports suggest that tipping points could be exceeded even between one and two degrees centigrade of warming." End quote. The IPCC's 2018 special report on global warming of 1.5 degrees focuses on several high-risk areas. Each group of risks is indicated by a vertical bar. Colors from yellow to orange to red indicate increasing impacts and risks that vary with temperature. The thin gray horizontal band shows where we were from 2006 until 2015. We are now above that band. We are venturing through a minefield of climate tipping points. These parts of our Earth are at significant risk of triggering tipping points. Coral reefs, Arctic Greenland and Antarctic ice sheets, boreal forests, Amazon rainforest, permafrost, and Gulf Stream or Atlantic circulation. It's impossible to locate with certainty the point of no return until that point has been passed. But we know that global heating is caused by human activity, both past and present. Until we reduce emissions and remove accumulated carbon from the atmosphere, we will continue on a path to more and more warming and more and more impact. Stay tuned, our next video focuses on options to cool the planet.